What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to Calgary Barbell. Today, we are joined with another special guest. This is Nick Manders. Hi. And uh, Nick, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, I'm an 83 kilo powerlifter in the CPU. That's it. <laughs> and that is it. <laughs> you coach? I do coach. I am a coach for uh, CSF, or Clean Strength Fitness, okay. and that's also it, I guess. <laughs> Anyways, I don't Nick's been around. Uh, he's pulled a lot of really big deadlifts. He's hit some big totals. He's been on the world's team before, and he's a coach himself. So we wanted to get him on here to provide a bit of a different perspective on things. Nick has uh, some some interesting and controversial uh, even takes on uh, bracing and belt use in the deadlift and stuff. And from what I've seen, that's helped a lot of people. A lot of people have responded very positively to that and have had success kind of changing things based on Nick's advice. So we wanted to bring him on and I think look at probably a whole bunch of deadlifts here. So if you're interested in how to submit, check the link in the description box below to go to calgarybarbell.com. You can send everything in there. And um, without any further ado, let's throw it over to Dill to get the deets on the first lifter here. We get to start off with a really easy name. This is Chris Jen. I think just Christian is probably, <laughs> you could. I've never seen it spelled this way, but. Well, it's kind of like Chris's is stuff. <laughs> Versus Vicky, right? So Christian says, recently switched to sumo from, from conventional. Mm -hmm. um, and he says he looks in a mirror when he deadlifts and knows he shouldn't. <laughs> just curious what you think he should fix or work on. All right. Uh, low hanging fruit there to start with, given your looking in a mirror, you know you shouldn't, but you do, uh, turn around or just stop looking in the mirror. I think a lot of the times, one of the issues with looking in the mirror is that you're gonna be starting with your head picked up like that, right? One of the things that's gonna do is take a lot of slack out of your upper back and push you into or pull you into a little bit more extension there, making it harder to get into a good braced extension in the low back where I think we could be allowing for a little bit more flexion in the upper back by neutralizing the head, putting the head in line with the body a little more, probably looking down-ish somewhere like that. And then you're gonna be able to hold a better position in your low back and in your brace. Um, what do you think, Nick? What are, you, what are you seeing off the top here? I don't hate the head position. Uh, I think that typically using a mirror just it forces lifters to care too much about how their lift looks as opposed to how it feels. And mm -hmm. I think that that's the big issue with the mirror, not more so just that like you want to look at it. Yeah. So yeah, low hanging fruit, either um, find a space in the gym where you can look away from it, or you can even, you know, if you want to be obnoxious, you can stick a piece of paper over it or a yoga mat. I've told some of my athletes to do that. There and, you go. Uh, they don't do it because it's it looks terrible. Um, I think my big thing, and it's going to be sort of a running theme with my deadlifts at least, is just allowing more internal rotation. Okay. Not yeah. pushing the knees out so much. Um, I think that maybe even taking that foot position and swiveling the heel out a bit so, so that way, out, okay. you know, the feet are a bit more forward and you can go into a bit more pronation of the foot and allowing a bit more internal rotation of the hip. Right, so like the just kind of track in a yeah, little bit Yeah, it might here. just smoothen out the pull by allowing, you know, the hip to come out a bit further back and not being so forced to use the sort of back musculature to lock out the lift, right? Mm -hmm. Right now we have a lot of quads off the floor and then a lot of unrounding at the top. Whereas if we can sort of put the knees a bit more in, allow the hips to come a bit farther back as a result and have the adductors, the hamstrings, the glutes, that sort of like hip musculature in more of a position to swing through, you know, we might lose a bit of that sort of like textbook style deadlifting where the knees come really far out and then we have that more upright position. Mm -hmm. But the trade-off is then we have a very, very smooth lockout because the hips are in a position that they can just sort of swing through at the end. The shoulders can come back nice and smooth. You're yeah. not so reliant on just like lumbar extension. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of that um, sort of school of thought of allowing for a little bit more of a straightforward knee angle, um, allowing the hips to be a little further from the bar. Because I think the other thing we see a lot of times when people are overdoing that external rotation is this kind of lag between like, okay, we're starting the pull here, we're starting the pull, we're starting the pull, we're starting the pull, and you'll see like the knees kind of have to come in in order for the hips to find enough stability to actually get that bar off the floor like starting knee position from where you start applying pressure and 
the point where the knee comes into before the bar comes off the floor, we're looking at a pretty substantial difference there, right? So, yeah, I fully agree with that. Um, in terms of, of the amount of, of kind of rounding, we do see the lifters, you know, hips kick up behind him. We see him going to a little bit more lumbar flexion off the floor here. You know, he kind of, his brace changes shape pretty decently as he's coming up off the floor. What's your, what's your take on that? Or what do you think would be the things to fix, if anything, based on seeing that kind of change before the bar lifts? Put yourself into the position that you're going to be in. I think that instead of, if you're already going to end up in flexion, or relative flexion rather, mm -hmm. um, don't try to force extension off the ground to try and counteract that, because you'll just get pulled into flexion anyways, mm -hmm. and then you've lost a ton of movement, right? Yeah. Um, if you're already finding yourself getting pulled into flexion on every single pull, just allow more flexion at the start, and then brace from there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, if every single pull he's just rounding over, I would just accept more rounding and then move around that. And then you'll probably end up having a lot more energy and movement just transferred into the movement of the barbell as mm -hmm. opposed to moving around it before the barbell picks up off the floor. Yeah, yeah, you're gonna be applying a lot less pressure before we're able to create enough rigidity to transfer the force. So a little bit less wasted energy there. Cool. How do you feel about Uo? What, oh. I was gonna say about his arms. About his arms. So interestingly enough, I was kind of thinking I might think that he could go uh, maybe a little narrower. I think one of the reasons he's driving his knees out so far is because his grip looks a bit wide for his frame. I think that if he narrowed it up a little bit, not only is he gonna be able to get a little bit more upright with his torso angle, but I think he's gonna have an easier time getting his knees where they need to go without them running into his arms. What were you thinking about his arms? I was also thinking narrow, but I was also thinking almost to maybe even hook grip looser. Okay. I feel like he's really like squeezing the hell out of it. And because of that, you're getting like that really uh, like tense yeah, arm that's yeah. really bent. The yeah. hand is even sort of like- You can see that roll. Yeah, it right, rolls, it rolls right down a bit. So if he just loosened it up, maybe even, you know, and, and it's a hard ask to always tell people to buy things, but if you can invest in like a really solid chalk, yep. you know, you can rely on that friction more. You can grip a little less on the bar, let yep. it hang a little lower in your hand. You get to lose some ranges of mo or some range of motion because of it, because yep. it just hangs a little lower and it's more secure. He doesn't have to focus so much on just gripping it. He can let it hang in his hand. He can let the arms go as long as they want. Yeah. And you know, just clean up that entire upper portion of the lift, I think. For sure. Um, and I think if you look at the, the, the orientation of his wrist and his hand at the top at lockout, like this is more where you want to start. Yeah. And, and kind of pull that slack out of your grip until you're at that point before the bar comes off the floor. Because I think if we look at where he is at here, his hands are like rotated more around the bar. He's got that bar a lot deeper. He's got a lot more of his fingers on the bar. And then it kind of rolls out of his hands and away from him as he goes through, which I mean, that's the worst feeling ever in terms of like the difficulty of a lift or feeling like you're secure in applying pressure is if that bar is kind of slowly working its way away from you, the RPE will climb three, you know, yeah, uh, in a single rep. Because the bar is moving in your hand as you're trying to move the bar. So I think gripping at the lowest point and also like trying to start at the highest point is something mm -hmm. that I really focus on in my pulls. And I think yeah. that it would benefit him a lot. Yeah, that's a good catch. I didn't even see the, um, the lifter's hands or, or grip, really. Let it hang, Christian. Let it hang. Next up, we have Ben. <laughs> All right, Ben. <laughs> uh, ben is six feet tall, 88 kilos, and has been lifting for four months. Okay. Needs to eat. He has two questions. Uh, ben says, I used to squat way too deep, and now I'm trying to just hit parallel. Have I overcorrected, or is my depth okay? Question number two is, I have a bit of a butt wink and possibly related minor lower back pain the day after squats that feels a bit sharper than regular Dom's pain. Any suggestions on fixing the lower back rounding? Do you want to start, Nick, or should I? Take a go at it. All right. I'm still looking at it. So I think the biggest thing I'm seeing here, Ben, is number one, a lot of the sort of excessive movement and excess movement I'm seeing here is coming from what appears to be a bit of a loose shelf and a bit of an inconsistent brace. So I think number one, we're not super locked in with the upper back and shoulders, right? You can see 
We hit this first rep here, the bar kind of pulls forward a little out of the bottom. We get to the top, bar's rolling down your back now, and then you're trying to you know, adjust the upper back to find tightness. It's really common in lifters. I see them pulling their elbows forward to try to create tightness. Not a huge fan of that cue. I think to some extent getting the elbows forward can create a little bit of tightness, but I think more often than not, what we need to be doing is kind of aiming the elbows in towards the sides or even imagining a point in the middle of your back where you're trying to pull your elbows towards. But it may be that we need to move this bar up or down slightly in order to find a good stable position on your back. That's number one. And that's something that you can sort out before you even unrack the bar. Number two, and we haven't even gotten to the depth yet, but it looks like the first movement out of the, out of the bottom on any of these reps is you're trying to drive your chest up, right? We can see this shift from a more sort of like neutral or, or slightly flexed position to going into a little bit of extension or, or you know, minorly extended position. And that movement under load, that, that flexion extension is probably why we're getting a little sore, right? You come down and you're in, you know, more or less a kind of flexed position. And then on the way up, everything kind of resolves into this like little bit of extension. You can see the head move a little bit. We're looking down on the way up. We're looking out, or sorry, down on the way down. We're looking out on the way up. And I think those changes in sort of how you're bracing throughout the lift are making for a lot of instability. So we're getting to the bottom and each rep, each time we're coming up is slightly different because in some reps, the knees are shooting back, the hips are shooting back, and we're seeing this like kind of wiggling throughout the trunk on its way up. I think towards the end of the set here, we get into a bit of a smoother descent where we're actually kind of hitting the position we need to on the way down. And we're hitting from what, from this angle, it looks like depth. It's very close, but this angle is notoriously bad for depth. This is going to make everything look higher than it is. And that taken into account, I think at least rep two, I would say is good. Rep three and one, maybe not so much. I think as we move on, there's some reps that are deeper than others, but the general, and I think the biggest thing that I would have you try to work on is getting into, not necessarily even just a comfortable bottom position, but getting into a bottom position where you can maintain your brace and where you can, you know, drive with your legs without having to feel the need to like reach your chest and your head up like that. Cause I think that flexion on the way down, extension on the way up, driving your chest up, we're seeing like a bit of looseness in the trunk there. Some reps were staying a little flexed like that one. Some were driving for extension. It's just a consistency thing. And I think the more you practice, the better it's gonna get. But bracing and, and you know, upper back, shoulder, elbow position would be kind of the first things I would tackle there. What do you think, Nick? I would love to see like a full setup and mm -hmm. like the unrack and everything. Cause I think that this is, and, and I am assuming here, but this does look like one of those squats where the setup was very hasty. We sort yeah, of picked yeah. up the bar, walked it out. I think as soon as there's weight on your back, you need to really consider like this idea that I, I always call it like movement economy, right? Every okay. single thing that you do, do now is going to be taxing, right? You have weight mm. on your back. So the more importance we can put on the setup, and putting everything into a good position before we've unracked the bar, the better. And I think that this is really a squat that's like indicative of that. I think that if he really took the time to sort of wedge himself into the bar before picking it up out of the rack, like you said, we have that much more stable shelf. Um, we can really stack up that sort of torso and get it nice and rigid. So then it's not so much of an issue during the squat. Mm -hmm. um, you said he was six foot, right? Yeah. Again, so it's hard to those. just tell people to buy things, but I do think that with him being so tall, heels would probably really help. Yeah. Um, his heels are coming up a bit off the squat, and that's not always the worst thing, but because of how tall he is and how important center of mass control is in a squat, it's going to be really hard to keep that constant without like a wedge under your foot. Um, as such a tall lifter. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, he can just play around with it, put some plates under the heels first to see how much of a help that makes. And then when he can uh, sort of afford it or he sees that maybe it's worth the investment, pick up some heeled shoes. Yeah. I think that those alone would make a world of difference. And then, yeah, just that more sort of more intent on the unrack, I mm -hmm. think would help a ton. Yeah. Um, we don't really, 
I don't know that. It's the assumption I can make off of the squat. Like I said, we don't have footage of it, mm -hmm. but I think that those two would be the real game changer. The, and then from there, it is just sort of like nitpicking more so after the fact. I think that those two things would sort of self-correct a lot in the movement. Yeah. Um, and then the back pain and the butt wink, I think could be addressed externally through sort of direct to lower back accessories. I think that they're super underrated, mm -hmm. right? If your lower back always hurts and you don't really know how to control it in flexion or extension, do some lower back extensions, you yeah. know? Work it through those ranges of motion, see how it feels under load directly, and then you aren't so afraid of flexion when it occurs in a squat. Um, I think that butt wink a lot of the time is just, you get the idea that butt wink is bad, you try to force a ton of, ton of extension. Mm -hmm. When you hit the hole, mm -hmm. you get forced into flexion, and it's scary because you don't know what's going on, and you've heard that butt wink is a really bad, scary thing. Mm -hmm. So then it becomes sort of this feedback loop and uh, self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. So yeah. Working on that externally outside the squat, I think, would be a huge help. Yeah. Yeah, and I think watching, you know, the, the lifter's feet was definitely something that, that I picked out because there's... There's that sort of like internal uh, in inversion, right? Inversion, yeah. eversion. Um, and I think a lot of the times a heeled shoe, because it's so much more solid, can kind of cheat you out of that pattern as well. Like where there's not as much room for you to just kind of actually see the shifting on the feet. And, and maybe it's still happening to an extent, but it's not affecting your balance as much because that wedge and the bottom and the sole of the shoe are so stiff and rigid in a squat shoe. So I think that's another thing that would be helped by potentially a squat shoe. But yeah, I mean, with the brace and the bar position being a main concern, like addressing what you can before the unrack is absolutely the, the big play, right? Because you can spend as much time as you want fiddling around, getting things set, making sure it's tight, making sure it feels light when you unrack it, making sure your brace is set. You can do all that before unracking and then ideally we're just holding it through the set, yeah. so. Anything else? No, not okay. that I can do. What do you think of his depth? The depth is fine. Yeah, I would, okay. you know, in a singlet especially, I probably would give that a white light from our side. Okay, all right. Dylan, what do you think of the depth? It's good. Whoa. Ben, you've impressed Dylan, and Dylan has not thought a squat was in since 19. I didn't say I was impressed. I just said it was good. I was just in. <laughs> it was just depth. All right. What's uh, going on here now? Next up, we have Ivan. Mm -hmm. Ivan says he's been stuck with deadlift for 45 days while his squat and bench are getting better. Um, let's see. He also says, feels like I can only lift 200 kilos after the knees if I bounce with my back. I think he's meaning hitching. Which mistakes do you identify and what can I do to improve? Have we looked at this guy's deadlift before? I don't think so. I haven't. I feel like <laughs> I feel like we've looked at like this exact deadlift and Seth and I talked a lot about just like ego management and expectations. Yeah, because I was gonna say 45 days is not <laughs> a lot. I've gone years without anything moving. It's yeah. just the sport. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that would, I mean, take it away. What, uh, what, would, what would your, and I think we can touch on more than just like the lift mechanics here as well. Yeah, I think, I think that the more 45 that day is like a huge sell. I mean, the hitch, the blocks. If we're in a straw man, this is a different story entirely, mm -hmm. right? Because yeah. I almost thought this was a straw man pull at first. Mm -hmm. um, that bar also almost looks like an axle for some reason. It's not. Um, but yeah, I'd say that like psychologically, it's the ego management. It is just accepting that 45 days is not that long. Um, there's probably some programming issues there of just like you need to really dial things back and just allow more time to grow. Keep yourself more in the pocket. Leave more road to travel on. Mm -hmm. Let there be more chains to link, blah, 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 blah. Um, I don't think that block pulls at an RPE 10 is the answer. Um, I would yeah. Rarely is it ever the answer. I don't personally like block pulls. That's, yeah. I, I don't think that they're useless by any means, but I definitely don't think that just trying to like, okay, if I can get this thing off the floor, we're good. So I just need to like learn how to lock it out through block pulls. 
So there's probably much more programming things that you could address as a coach mm -hmm. as opposed to like technical things. Not to say there aren't technical things. I think that here, someone that really gets stuck at lockout, I think can really benefit from allowing a more bent over torso position. Again, the hips a bit farther back to allow like the musculature to swing through, blah, blah, blah. I don't think that block pulls are going to help that. I think that they're really going to hurt it because the bar being higher up allows you to get into that more upright position, allows you to like really set up with more quads. It's gonna make lockout not just harder in the block pull because of how you're able to set it up, but it's going to transfer really poorly into the pull from the floor because mm -hmm. now you're gonna be setting up as upright as you possibly can to try and mimic your block pull. You're gonna get it off the ground maybe through just like a ton of like knee extension, and like quads, and then it just, Again, the bar, because of how you've, how you've positioned yourself, it runs right into your knees, right into your quads. You're always gonna end up trying to hitch it because you have nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. You've completely, you've locked out everything other than your back at this point, and you're just trying to unround. And block pulls just really reinforce that movement pattern that isn't gonna help your lockout in any way, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, to, I think the, the first thing to address is, yeah, like if you know that you haven't made progress in 45 days, that is almost an issue in and of itself, right? Because it, to me, for most people, that's not going to mean like I took a really critical look at my E1RM tracking across multiple blocks and saw that we didn't progress over 45 days. That's going to be like, well, I hit a single at 10 RP and then 10 days later, 145 days later, whatever we tried another single at 10 RP and it wasn't more weight. And that indicates that, you know, maybe like Nick said, there are some much larger programming and, and training philosophy things to look at. Um, the first of which being, you know, how often we're approaching a maximal single rep. And I think the, further you get into your training career, probably the less likely that is helpful as a training tool. Like there's a reason that most power lifters will incorporate singles, but there's also a reason where most power lifters will not incorporate regular singles that are max effort attempts. Generally speaking, in powerlifting training, we're taking a single that's somewhere between 85 and 95%. Very sort of like loose outside borders, but. Doing that allows you to really practice the skill. It's very specific, but that in and of itself is not powerlifting training. We need repetition. We need more work. We need submaximal work. And there's more than enough research to show that, you know, submaximal training and very hard training in a lot of cases don't necessarily produce super different results when it comes to the skill relevant adaptations of powerlifting, big compound movements. So I'll also echo Nick's sentiments a little bit with the block pulls. I've used block pulls in my own training. I feel like the position just gets so much different than what you would be doing if you pulled off the floor that unless you're making a very concentrated effort in your block pull to pull from the exact position you would be in at that portion of the range of motion in a conventional or off the floor, whatever your comp pull is, then we're really just not gonna see that carryover. It's too, it's too different for a lot of carryover and it's like different enough that it might start messing with your comp pattern. So I think it's a double-edged sword and both of them are pointed at you. It's, it's weird geometry. Um, lastly, to actually take a look at the pull itself, I would probably either widen your grip or narrow your stance a little bit. It looks to me like we're crowding the knees in. If we were to see you from the front, uh, I think we would see, you know, foot here, foot here, and knees kind of in like this, which makes it really hard to use the hips and to keep this sort of like consistency and hip extension that we want, right? Because you see we go through and then end up really rounded out. We lose a lot of the hip extension we had. That turns into lumbar extension, and then we just get, or, sorry, flexion. Uh, and then we just get super stuck. So, uh, I mean, I think those are probably the biggest things there, but yeah, the philosophy of being stuck for 45 days and, you know, checking your max, testing your max, 
very regularly in the gym, I think are, are kind of problematic for long-term progress as well. Anything else to add? I don't hate the widths of the stance or the grip. Okay. I do agree that the hips aren't being used. Um, I think that like, that's sort of like, now I am looking now at his knees and I think that he does try to like force them out. And I think that's maybe, if you're already sort of bowed in and mm -hmm. you try to force them out, then the hips sort of get closed off, right? Because now they have to externally rotate and they get sort of like shoved under you. I think that if, if he just allows the knees to stay in, I think, if you watch like a lot of like the really big straw men that are sort of built in that sort of like blocky capacity, mm -hmm. a lot of them have that sort of like wider foot stance than knee path, if mm -hmm. you will. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I do agree that he needs to learn how to use his hips. So, you know, if you want to do like a big ego accessory, do some SLDLs, do some really heavy straight leg deadlifts. Mm -hmm. um, those boost my ego and they'll really like teach you how to use your hips how to hinge, um, I think that would be like a much better accessory for him than block pulls. Yeah. Uh, that's what I would prescribe for him is just, you know, if you want to go all out on like some RP9, 10 heavy work, put it into your accessories, grow some hamstrings, grow some strong posterior, and that'll really carry over in your pull. Yeah, yeah, I mean, even if you don't get the, the skills component of doing heavy stiff legs, and it, it maybe doesn't do that much for your coordination in terms of your hinge, at the very least, you're gonna develop the hell out of your lower back, hips, and hamstrings in a very specific way, so. And being strong never Literally hurts. no downside. Yeah. <laughs> being strong is good for being strong. You heard it here, <laughs> folks. All right. Who's next, Dylan? Next up, we have Mayhar. Mayhar. Oh. Not the Mayhar you guys know. Oh, Not the yeah. Mayhar we know. <laughs> I was going to say, get it off the screen. Turns <laughs> out there's more than one Mayhar in the world. Uh, Mayhar says, what assistance exercises do you think I need based on sticking point? Is my descent too slow? Is my stance too narrow? And his goal is to get to 250 kilos soon. Soon. Is he wearing a belt? I don't know. I think maybe I, under the shirt, but I'm maybe. not sure. I don't see a belt. All right, first thing, wear a belt. You already got the shoes and the sleeves. You can afford the belt. Just get the belt. Yeah. Belt's going to help the brace a lot. Um, what do you think of his depth? You think it's there? Uh, I think it's right on the line. I would need a better angle and though, like, you know. Yeah, I'm not really convinced either way. I'm not going to say it's high, but I'm also not going to say that it's Yeah, it's, it's not, in. like, like terrible uh, by no means. It's not egregious, no. Yeah, I wouldn't make fun of him by any means, but you know, if I was a referee heading into it, I would definitely be, you know, leaning in my chair to watch his specific depths. Yeah. Um, and with his, you know, he was, he was asking about accessory movements and what else is he, is he too narrow? Yep. That was the other thing, though? Is my stance too narrow? What do you think, Nick? It is just a really odd angle to like, get a lot from. I think like as a coach, this is one of those ones where I would just tell my athlete, like, give me a better angle, honestly. Right, okay. There's not, it is It is tough to see a lot of what I want to see. There's not a lot of info that I want to gather here. Mm -hmm. The stance might be too narrow, but I would also want to see how he looks wide. It might all just collapse as soon mm -hmm. as he goes wide, right? He could be one of those squatters. Um, it does just look like he sort of collapses a bit under the bar and has to, has to fight that. But mm -hmm. Also, some guys do really well with that, so he might just need to get really, really strong in that position. Mm -hmm. Again, I'd say a belt would help a lot in terms of accessory movements. I would just get really strong. I, I think that, like, depth aside, you know, how much is that? Is that, like, He's got 545? Yeah, with my 545, pound plate? I guess, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. still good. Looks like it. It's a strong squad. For right. sure, yeah, like, and he moves it decently well, yeah. right? Like, that's not that sticky, eight and a half, nine, maybe? Honestly, I would just, accessories, I would do stuff that just got me big and strong. I would hack squat a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I would also do like a weird amount of Bulgarians. I think that the way that he sort of like shifts out of it, you know, the hips don't look too much in play. It looks like it's sort of like a lot of quad and knee extension to get out, and then just like a lot of brute force in the back to sort of like stand up. Mm -hmm. I think that Bulgarians to really sort of like get the adductor going, get that sort of hip moving better, 
um, and allowing like the hip to sort of trace back more just naturally as like a movement pattern in our arsenal would do a lot. And, and then maybe you can start looking at sort of like bringing the stance out to see if that would help. I think that right now, just looking at it, I think if you pull the stance out, he would just end up collapsing a lot. Yeah. He's very, very stacked. And I don't know if he has the sort of like, and again, he, he has a lot of clothing on, so it's hard to say. I'm making a lot of assumptions here. I don't know if he has the musculature to support that sort of like collapse, right? right. So just doing a bunch of accessories that would just build up a lot of mass, a lot of strength, and also allow for a bit more internal rotation of the hip when it gets to that point would help. So hack squats, Bulgarians, even like leg presses would probably do a ton for him. Just get big, get strong. Yeah. Um, yeah and I think obviously the brace is kind of the first thing my eyes are drawn towards. Uh, if you're not wearing a belt under there, definitely, you know, belt's gonna go a long, long ways for just transferring the force from your legs through to the bar. And the other thing I think we're seeing a, a decent amount of breakdown in is the upper back. So I think when it comes to accessory movements and even when it comes to kind of cueing your squat, I think we can do a bit better job making sure that the upper back is in a better position. It looks to me like as we start to get stuck, we start to see those shoulder blades kind of creep up your upper back. And I think that keeping more of the muscles of your upper back tighter is gonna keep that bar more locked in place. So I would probably actually widen your grip. And I think that, you know, I've talked about this uh, in the last little while, but this idea of like passive versus active tightness. And I think what's happening here is you're able to get into this position where you, you can like wedge your hands in there and it's gonna bunch up the musculature and your shoulder blades and everything in your upper back, but it's not gonna allow you to be as active and we can see it through the concentric movement here, right? We start to inch out and we start to have to move the elbows around to try to catch some tension. I think moving your grip slightly wider, trying to pull the elbows in towards your sides, trying to incorporate your lats into the brace, trying to get more of the muscles around your shoulder blade, contributing to stabilizing the upper part of your trunk would be you know, sort of the first place I would start with cueing. In terms of the width, I mean, if you were my athlete, I would say, let's keep doing this until it doesn't work or until we have some indication that we shouldn't because you've, you've built this squat using this stance width. Um, I'm gonna assume that it's relatively comfortable. It's relatively consistent. It allows you to squat more or less pain-free. You know, again, there's a lot of assumptions, but I mean, that looks like a pretty clean squat. It doesn't look like you're struggling with, you know, pain throughout it and with accessory movements, I think again, leaning into reinforcing good bracing habits and good upper back tension and strength, pause squats, pin squats. Uh, I really like the suggestion of Bulgarians. I think, I don't know, I'm a huge, huge leg press fan as of the last like six months. That's a bias for my own personal training, but I think leg press is great. And I would also probably do heavy upper back work. I would have you doing heavy rows, chest supported rows, maybe bent over barbell rows, um, pendley rows, meadows rows, basically anything heavy that's working your upper back and forcing you to hold your upper back in position while moving the arm. And I think that's the big distinction I make between upper back training that's directed at trying to train for, you know, sort of the support of the bench or the support of the lower body movements is whether or not the sort of trunk is involved or to what extent the trunk is involved when we're moving the shoulders through the upper back movements. Um, yeah, I think that would be kind of the gist of my advice for you. Anything to add? No. All right. It's a good squat. I'm going to feel really stupid if he is wearing a belt. I, I honestly like, the like thing is just you wear a belt. I'm like looking at I keep the looking way at that his shirt right? kind of pulls here and I feel like maybe there's a belt under there. Like that line there looks like it might be a belt, but I don't, I don't know. I, don't know. I mean, he's got like, what, ROM 4s. That's what I'm saying. He's so got SBD speed. sleeves, like. I imagine he has a belt. Yeah. But also, I don't know if he has a belt. I don't know. And it's the lowest hanging fruit. <laughs> yeah. All right. Lastly, Dylan, who's our last victim today? Lastly, we have Hugo. Hugo's 18 and competes in the 105 kilo weight class. Okay. Hugo's uh, an equipped lifter. Yes, this is equipped. 
I'm having trouble finding a consistent and solid starting position and brace in my equipped deadlift. Additionally, I have trouble with the lockout and tend to be wobbly and have a tendency to get red lighted because of me losing balance at the last moment. Uh, right now I'm in the week six of the Calgary Barbell 16 week program and we'll soon be doing a meet to hopefully qualify for junior equipped nationals next month. He's from Sweden, by the way. Cool. Um, I don't train <laughs> I train with equipped people and yeah. I stay out of it. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll take the lead here. And if you, if you think of anything, feel free to One jump in. One thing I can think of is shoes. Shoes. Just like, yeah. you know, just wear shoes. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> some kind of shoe. You're going to have to compete in some kind of shoe. You mentioned balance issues. Train in the shoe you're going to compete in. Yeah. If you're on ply, I mean, I just saw it. If you're on plywood in socks, you're going to slip. And like right at the top here, you can watch it. His foot just like rotates out a bit. It just isn't going to happen if you're in shoes. Although that might actually be indicative, indicative of... You might want to just start in like a slightly more out position if your foot wants to swing out. Just like start toe, just a little. Yeah, yeah. But that's all I got. I don't train equipped. <laughs> okay. So, Hugo, I think our start position looks somewhat inconsistent from rep to rep, right? I think here we get. I think in every rep, like this is one thing that we do really well. I think you're getting really good positioning with the low back and hips, but. The thing that's inconsistent is how far over the bar we are, how sat down we are, our torso angle. And I think if this was a raw deadlift, I would basically say this position's perfect. Just kind of pull your shoulder blades in a little bit, right? Pull them down and forward, you know, down your sides, however you want to cue it. But because we're equipped, I would challenge you to sit those hips down a little harder and drive those knees, you know, forward and out maybe less out, but just let them go forward, keeping a very similar sort of balance to what you have on your foot. Because in the suit, we can afford to, you know, force the hips lower. That's how we're gonna get more out of the suit. The deeper we sit, right, the more the, the suit is gonna kind of reinforce us being able to maintain that, that back angle because it's reinforcing the hips. So, that was, this was actually a bit better start position. And you can see you actually kind of pulled in a little harder. You let the knees go forward more, you got the hips a little lower. And I think, you know, in a suit, there's so much different feedback. There's so many different things and tightnesses and ways that it's ripping your skin and all kinds of fun stuff like that. So it's really important to kind of try to either use those to your, to your advantage or set them aside and just set up how you need to set up. So one way to use them to your advantage would be, what I found with equipped lifting was, I would pull into basically where the suit bit the most. And when I'm talking about suit bite, I mean like around the front of the quad and along your adductors. And I knew that if I didn't pull in hard enough, it wasn't gonna, it wasn't gonna bite quite as much, but I wasn't gonna be in as good of a position. So I knew that I needed to push in, get to the point where I'm starting to feel the suit bite, and then pull in a little more. And, you know, more of those classic cues that I think often have been misconstrued and overused in raw, like driving the chest up a little bit, pulling your hips towards the bar. A lot of things I don't recommend and often am vehemently opposed to for raw lifters are kind of the way I would probably push you here, just so that we got that little bit more out of the suit. And with the balance issues, I think just like you're doing a pretty good job of it, right? You're coming through, you're locking out. This one looks like we locked out maybe a little forward, like it was almost coming out and coming down before we wanted it to. So just practicing the lockout, right? Making sure that every time you lock out, you're selling it, you're holding it, and then setting it down, right? Don't let yourself just lock out and down and make sure that if you're gonna you know, lean back a little at the top, that we're leaning back the same amount each time. Generally speaking, I don't usually recommend people lean back very much or, or do as much back extension. I think like there-ish, like you're, you're locked out there for sure, but we're also locked out like there. Right? So if you think more about locking out up and less about locking out back, 
I think that tends to help people's balance because what happens is we lean back, you know, the mass of our upper body is back here, the, the, the uh, upper limb of the leg tilts a little more that way, we're more likely to unlock the knees, we're more likely to kick the bar out in front of us. There are a number of things that can kind of, you know, interact negatively with the, the, with the lockout and with the balance when it comes to, um, you know, kind of overextending a lockout. Don't treat equipped. <laughs> so a lot of. But I mean, the thing about equipped deadlifts is that deadlifts are deadlifts. Are deadlifts. deadlifts are deadlifts. Okay. Um, I will say that, like, okay, if we're going to talk about balance and we're going to talk about selling a lockout, I mm -hmm. think something super underutilized is your head position, mm -hmm. right? Your head is decently heavy. If you're always falling backwards, jut your head forwards. It will act as a counterweight. And also, if you really want to sell a lockout, having your chin up, like you're trying to force extension, like you're still trying to lock out never looks like you're locked out. If you wanted to sell it, jut your chin down and forward mm -hmm. and your shoulders could be way over your hips and you look locked out. So yeah. if you want to just pull sell your lockouts, pull your head down, pull it a bit forward, it'll help balance and it'll help sell it. There you go. And that works for equipped or raw, I imagine. I yeah, know. yeah. Yeah, because that's a, a gonna be like kind of a perception thing, right? Is you can tell when a lifter's struggling through lockout like this, because most lifters when they get up into their lockout, yeah, then they pull their head back down, yeah, right? You gotta pull it down. So, there you go. Little, uh, I don't know, li lift hack. How to cheat in powerlifting. How to cheat in powerlifting, that's I've the title. I've gone a ton of deadlifts that were definitely not locked, <laughs> white lighted, at like pretty high <laughs> stages of competition just cause I'm like, I'm not locking this, boom. Pull your head yeah, down. that's why it's, especially cause nowadays you always see the judges, they sit at like the They front. sit pretty in they front a lot of the time. Front, so you just have to sell it. Yeah. Right? You don't actually, like, if you want to really, like, push the limits of the deadlift, never film it from the side anymore, because it'll <laughs> always look bad. None of my deadlifts look good from, like, certain angles. Like, straight on side angle? Yeah, it looks terrible. But from the front, it always looks locked. So. Yeah. I, I do the opposite, and I film a lot of my deadlifts straight on from the side, just so that I know. Uh, and then Dylan films them from the front for our vlogs, so. Yeah. <laughs> and... Looking back at that, that 345 I pulled in prep, it looked very different from those two angles. Very different. One was good, one wasn't. One was I good, imagine. one was not, yes. All right, well, I want to give a big thank you to Nick for coming on and, and lending his expertise today. If people want to find you, where can they find you, man? Uh, Instagram, n.manders, and that's really it. I don't have a YouTube, I don't have... I mean, you can find me on Facebook if you really want to, but... Do you guys, does Clean Strength have a uh, website? You could, well, yeah, we have a cleanstrengthfitness.com, I think is it. We're working on it right now, but you can also find us on Instagram through Clean Strength Fitness. Um, that is just our handle, so... And also, the link is in my bio to both the website and to the page, so... Sweet. Cool. Well, thanks for tuning in, everybody. We'll see you next time, and uh, maybe Nick will still be here in maybe. a week. In a week, in a whole week's time. We're not going to move. I might. <laughs> All right. Bye.